morning. It's Sunday morning, Mother's Day. Welcome, welcome to worship online with First Presbyterian Church Fullerton. I'm Jeff Bridgman, and we're so glad you're here. You know, there's so much out these days about to be fearful about, but we come together even online to worship our great God who casts out all fear with his perfect love. It was great to see so many of you on the church social Zoom uh, gathering we had on Friday. Glad that you're here today, too. If you're a guest, a special welcome with you. If there's anything we can do, please don't hesitate to contact us through the church. Uh, I have a couple of announcements for you. First of all, uh, Daniel Mendoza, who's given three years to minister to youth, both in the church and beyond the church, has done a remarkable job of touching young people's lives and their families. Uh, Daniel has uh, moved. He's moved uh, down San Diego Way, and he and his wife have purchased a house, and they're beginning a new career in that area. So we want to uh, lift up Daniel in prayer. Remember him, and if you'd like to send him a note or somehow acknowledge him, send him a gift, uh, you can do that through the church. Uh, send it to FPC, and we will uh, pass that all on to Daniel. But we want to express our love and gratitude for him. In fact, I want to pray for him right now. How about we do that? Lord God, we want to thank you for the very special ministry of Daniel. He has been uh, a real agent of transformation in the lives of young people. He has brought in uh, people who never thought they would be anywhere close to God, had no place for God in their lives, and he's shown them your love and your grace in such a remarkable way. So we want to lift Daniel up to you and Lizzie, his wife, as they uh, transition into life in the San Diego area. Provide him the direction for his calling. Protect Lizzie, a nurse, as she works hard uh, in this coronavirus time. And may they be a blessing as they have been to us. We pour out our blessing on them in the name of Christ. Amen. Hey, secondly, uh, we have been receiving greetings from you all during these last couple of weeks. And we, we insert them into our worship service. And uh, so uh, we're going to do something a little bit different this Sunday, but I want to remind you, encourage you, even challenge you to send in a, a little five second, 15 second uh, greeting. Uh, just tell the church how much you, you miss them and how you care for them. Uh, just say happy Sunday if that's all you got to say. But we really want to see you and hear from you. I want to challenge all our elders to do that, as well as a very special group of ladies. There's some senior singles, and I know this might be a technical challenge, uh, but if you'd like to do it, we'll figure out how you could do it uh, to send us a greeting. Even if it's just a selfie and write out your greeting in your email, send it to fpctech, T-E-C-H, at fpcfullerton.org, and our team will compile those and put them together. It is such a delight. It adds so much to the service to have you add your greeting. So anyone, but a special challenge to our elders and our senior singles uh, to show us a little love on Sunday morning. Well, showing love is what Mother's Day is all about. On Mother's Day, we send out our hearts to women who have given us life women who have shaped our faith, who've given us direction and encouragement, who've been there for us. And whether they're your actual mom or they are a, a woman or some person who stood into that place, we want to give thanks for them. And, and so some of you have sent in pictures of your mom with a word describing her. And we'd like to give that opportunity to pay tribute to them. And uh, we've got a special piece of music for that. So let's listen and open our hearts for moms.
That was truly a great honoring of moms. Can't help but get a little teary-eyed and want to know all the stories behind all those pictures, don't you? Uh, again, I'd like to just pray for us as we uh, come to this time. Lord, you have given us mothers, and some mothers have been absolutely phenomenal, and some mothers have struggled to be an influence and even be present in our lives. There are folks today here who grieve that they never got to be mothers. There are many who grieve that they don't have their children around anymore. There are many of us who grieve that we don't have our moms, but uh, we have our moms in our hearts. And there ha I thank you for the actual men and women who have filled those places in our lives. Um, and I just want to acknowledge your goodness. Uh, we appreciate the gift of life that we have been given through them. And we pray that we will be good stewards as we care for men and women and children in the life of our community. Lord, we bless you in Christ's name. Amen. Join me now in the call to worship. It's from Psalm 57, verses 7 and through 11, and we're reading from the message version today. So let's join our voices together as we call one another to worship. I'm ready, God. So ready ready from head to toe, ready to sing, ready to raise a tune. Wake up, soul. Wake up, harp. Wake up, lute. Wake up, you sleepyhead son. I'm thanking you, God, out loud in the streets, singing your praises in town and country. The deeper your love, the higher it goes. Every cloud is a flag to your faithfulness. Soar high in the skies, O God. Cover the whole earth with your glory. Amen. Let's worship God in his song.
So join me now as we open the scriptures and discover God's heart for us. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for your word and may it challenge us and grow us and encourage us and comfort us. Speak to our hearts just where we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the word of God from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 18. Hear the word of God. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy on the house of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, he was in Rome. When he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. May God open our hearts and our minds to his word. Well, this is our second sermon in the series on Paul's last letter before his death, his letter to Timothy, his faithful protege. With words of encouragement and care, Paul says something to him now that's rather startling here in verse 8. So do not be ashamed of the testimony of our about our Lord or ashamed of me, as his prisoner. But join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now, instead of being ashamed that Paul is a prisoner, and you can understand that if you've ever had a friend or a family member who's been imprisoned, Paul invites Timothy to actually join him in his suffering. Now, who does that? Hey, I'm suffering. Come on, join me. What's that mean? Why would you ever dare accept? Sure, if you asked me to join you in your retirement villa in the south of France, I might consider suffering with you for a while. But Paul is in a deep, dark, forgotten cell in Rome awaiting death. His friend Onesphorus had to search hard, he says, to find him and care for Paul in prison. And even then, he didn't stay there in prison. So what does it mean? Who wants to join in the suffering Paul's talking about? Well, if you've read any of the scriptures, you know that suffering seems to go hand in hand with being a follower of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. James said, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. And Peter said, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Now, to suffer as a follower of Jesus was not a surprise to anyone in that early church, not to Timothy or anyone else. But Paul seems to have a different goal with his suffering. It's not to suffer Paul's pain. Rather, he's inviting him to share 
in the intimacy that it's produced with God. You know, when I think about suffering, I, I figure I must be doing something wrong, and, and I want to get out of that situation, stop the suffering. It's a bad thing. I surely don't want people to know that I'm suffering. Like a lot of men, I tend to deny the fact that I'm suffering. Paul's invitation reveals that suffering in relationship to the gospel isn't seen as a shameful or embarrassing thing, even though at that time the Roman government was making a concerted effort to stamp out Christianity to deter other believers. So there's already a good chance in that day that you were going to suffer. But Paul is telling us that there is a value there when we suffer with God. You see, God is less interested in our comfort than he is in our intimacy with him. To suffer meant that you'd represented Christ well, and the message of his love can be seen in your everyday life, revealing your trust in God, whatever the circumstances. And God valued that, even if the world doesn't. And that's still true today. Your intimacy with God has a witness and a power that you might not even know about, but it makes us distinctive in the world. We're not to pursue suffering in order to achieve intimacy with God, but because God's ways are so counter to the world, it's bound to find us, so we shouldn't be ashamed or discouraged. Not everyone is going to find our faith attractive or even a good thing for society. Accepting Paul's invitation to join him in the suffering is to decide, I am going to live a noticeable life for Christ. Even when responses might be negative, it's still valuable in God's eyes as it grows me to be his disciple. Verse 13 and 14 tell us, What you heard from me keep as a pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know, if we're going to guard that good deposit, we're guarding the gospel, aren't we? First, we must learn to treasure the gospel in order to guard it. See, when you go in a store or a museum and you see a whole lot of armed guards around a particular exhibit or a case in the store, you are sure that is the most valuable thing in that place. What would they guard in our hearts? Is the gospel a real treasure to you? Remember, we used Tim Keller's quote that, about what the gospel is and that message it says that you are more sinful than you ever dared believe. And you're more loved than you ever dared hope. But some people can never get past that sinful part. They take offense at that, so they're not even going to listen to the rest of that. And so what do we do? I've got to water that down. It sounds a little uh, harsh, so I water it down so it doesn't sound so bad. But listen, when we tone down sin, we are muting the greatness of God's love. If sin really isn't so bad, then God's love really isn't so amazing. The truth is, God doesn't love you any more because you're just sort of bad than God loves you if you are bad to the bone. That's what makes the gospel a treasure, a priceless, incomparable value to you and me. And that's the real reason why it's literally good news. Because you can't be too bad. You can't be too apostate. You can't be too evil, too far away, too forgotten to be written off for what you've done. You are loved by God more than you ever dared hope. That's great news. And that's the treasure of sound teaching that Paul refers to. It means a healthy teaching. Just like a person who had been healed by Jesus, they were said to have been made sound, made whole. Same word. Those sound teachings, that sound gospel, those words form a pattern 
for a healthy living with Christ which each and with each other. It's like a pattern you might use if you were making a, a, a dress or a garment, or it's the lines that an architect would draw to define the details of a, a building plans. The teaching of the gospel forms a healthy foundation on which each of us, individually and together as the church, are built. These words bring spiritual health and well-being even if we're under life's pressure, even if we're suffering, they will see us through. Now, when we treasure something, we want to know everything about it, don't you? Do you have something really precious? You probably plumbed the depths about it, looked it up on the internet, read books about it, studied the nuances and the complexity, discovered its beauty and its simplicity. All that adds to its value in our lives. Well, that's true with the gospel as well. This gospel reveals grace, which Paul says, God designated us for us before the beginning of time. Let that sink in. God designated grace for you and me before the beginning of time. That means that while God moved over this primordial chaos uh, of life in Genesis 1-1, before he got to verse 2, God acted and he ordained grace for you and me. I gotta say, that's hard to comprehend. How deep is God's love for you and me? Deeper than we ever thought before we were even cre uh, created, before we even had life, his grace was extended toward us. And when it was revealed to us, it was revealed in a form we could comprehend, made real in the man Jesus himself. In his life, we discover God's amazing love for us. And in his death, we encounter God's power to forgive our darkest secrets. Oh, what a treasure! No wonder we're supposed to guard it. But this is more than something to marvel at. Paul says we have to protect it to preserve it. In Central Africa Republic, armed bands of men, so-called Christian militia, surrounded a group of 800 Muslims, refugees, and demanded that they leave the country or they die. But the fleeing Muslim families found refuge in a very unusual place, in a church that opened its doors and its property for them to live there. The local priest and a small band of armed peacekeepers guarded the sanctuary, risking their lives to protect the Muslim refugees' lives. Why? Because of this gospel. Though they never thought they would live at a church, the families all agreed, if it weren't for the church and the peacekeepers, we'd all be dead. What's the gospel? The Apostle John wrote, Beloved, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, and whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Protecting the gospel means that we adhere to the fullness of God's word, even when it means that we're going to have to refuse to give in to the distortions of power and greed that are so contrary to the treasure of God's grace. The people of God have faced this challenge throughout our history, we have had to protect the gospel from the very beginning to today. Every time it's used as a weapon or a tool for someone else's agenda, protecting the gospel affects how we live. For when we allow it to affect us, we find a different voice in the world. Dr. Martin Luther King, in his book, Strength to Love, said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience 
of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool, protecting the gospel as did Paul before the might of Rome resulted in his suffering and so it just may result in suffering for us. But you know, in fact, when we protect the core of the gospel, it protects who we truly are. Remember in verse 12, Paul said, I know who I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. You know, to really believe something, not just in our head, it has to be in our living. We have to live it out. Paul was confident that his life, his soul, his peace, and his eternal well-being were entrusted to his God who'd protect them, even the face of the horrific things that lay before him. Thirty years, he entrusted himself to God and experienced so many different things. He knew the truth that God would not let him go. And now in the face of his own death, Paul proclaims the gospel that he believed in would preserve him until the glorious day, that day which is the day of Christ's return. In these days of our own uncertainty, is there something that is sure in your life? Is there one thing that is certain for you? Is it the gospel? Let me suggest something that will help, that will help you both treasure the gospel and protect that message in your life. Last Sunday, you remember I asked you to consider making a list or write a letter uh, that you wouldn't necessarily send to all the people who had helped shape your life of faith. Today, I want to ask you to make another list to create. Uh, this time, of scripture passages that speak to you. Take a tablet, I've got a little spiral bound notebook here or maybe a blank book or just staple some papers together. Paper clip them together, it, it, nothing fancy or fine and write down scriptures that are important to you. Like last Sunday's passage, 2 Timothy 1 through 7, that's one I'd have. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. And I'd even add verse 12 from today to that list as well. For I know what I have believed and entrusted to God. Build a treasure trove is what I'm asking you to do for yourself. Don't have to thumb through the Bible and figure out when you, when you hear it. Write it down so you can recall who God is and what God's love has done for you. But you see, Paul's admonition is greater than that. He, when he tells Timothy to guard the gospel, it goes beyond just holding on to something, creating a treasure trove, protecting it. This is not a directive to hoard or keep the gospel prisoner under lock and key. If we truly treasure the gospel of Christ's love and protect it, we have to do one more thing with it. We have to use it for when its impact makes it, or when uh, there's an impact, it makes it even more precious and more treasured. When the gospel comes alive to you, it comes alive to others. A couple of years ago, I came across a story that illustrates this. It was about two young high school students in inner city Cleveland, D'Artagnan Crockett and Leroy Sutton. Well, they were teammates on the school's wrestling team, but they were unique teammates because Crockett was legally blind and Sutton was a double-leg amputee. Imagine that. ESPN Sports, of course, thought that was a great thing, so they did a story on it, in which Crockett is often filmed being carried by Sutton on his back. They used that, what they had, to help each other, not discouraged by their limited abilities. Well, that's a picture of the gospel in and of itself, isn't it? Of us using what we have for others, not discouraged by what we don't have, but giving what we have that others might live more fully. Its impact 
is greater than we know. It reveals more of the treasure that's out there. See, this was an inspirational story, but the TV producer couldn't let it go. She, she took it on herself, even after the story was over, to see that those two young men went to college. She raised donations from around the world and coordinated college visits and assured the young men were well-fed every day. And thanks to her efforts, Crockett became a bronze medalist in judo in the Paralympics in London. And Sutton became the first member of his family to graduate from college. When asked by one of the young men why she did what she did, the producer revealed that she too had grown up in Cleveland but on the other side of town where her parents scraped together money so that she could go to a private school and be protected from those people like D'Artagnan and Leroy. But the young men had let her into their lives. They believed that she truly cared, and she did. She wrote, I stayed because... I would not be the next person on the list who walked out on them, who walked over their trust. I stayed because we only get one life and we don't truly live it until we give it away. That's the gospel, isn't it? She stayed because she said, we can change the world only when we enter into another's world. I stayed because I love you too. I think that's the gospel in action. And she didn't even know it. To guard it is to use it as it was intended to be, used for love, even when it means entering into someone else's suffering and struggle. That gives life to God's love. The good news is not fragile. You're not going to break it. In fact, the more we use it, the more it grows robust in us and in our world. We guard it when we treasure it. We explore it. We discover it. We protect it when we keep it true. And we use it to transform lives. And when we give it away, we discover that it's actually protecting us and allowing us to have a deeper intimacy with God, deeper than we ever imagined. Treasure the gospel, brothers and sisters. Guard the gospel. Use the gospel for the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we bow before you. I personally am amazed that you have given us such an incredible gift in the good news. Love more than we imagined, more than I could ever dare hope for. You've taught us to treasure it. Teach us more. Help us discover more of the ways it is a treasure. Guide us to be true to the gospel, to protect it, and to reflect it, and then show us how to use it. There's people in our lives right now who desperately need to be loved more than they can imagine. And as we do these things, draw us to your heart that we might dwell in intimacy with you. Now, Lord God, we want to intercede for people in our lives right now who are struggling I'm aware that as I speak right now, little Sydney Johnston, a four-year-old girl in our preschool, is, is dying. I pray, God, for your tender mercy for her mom, May, and for her dad, Todd, for her sister and for her brother as they walk through this hard and horrible place. What an awful Mother's Day reminder that will be but may it be a reminder of your grace and power as your church has reached out to surround them in your love. We lift them up to you, God. Come, Holy Spirit, and be upon them. 
Thank you, God, for lives well lived in our midst, for our folks who have contributed so much to who we are as a church today. May we be good stewards of that in the future. May we discover what they have treasured so much, what they have protected, and what they have used for your glory alone. Gracious God, there are people in our lives right now who are in need, and so in a moment of silence, we intercede for them. Lord, hear the prayers of your people for our beloved ones. And Lord, for those that we know and those that we can't name, for the prayers that well up inside of us and we can't give voice to, we pray, Holy Spirit, you would intercede for us and bring those prayers to the feet of the Savior. For he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's join our voices together as we sing our praise to our great, great God, for whom we are most thankful. join me in the benediction. Ah, I just long for those times where we could grab hands. Reach out, reach out, and if there's someone in the room with you, grab their hand. Or reach out to bless the community and the world around us, shall we? And now go in peace and bless the world. And remember, you go nowhere by accident. Where you're going, God is sending you. And where you are, he has placed you. God has a purpose for your life. 
right where you are. Christ Jesus, who indwells you, has something he wants to do in and through your life right where you are. Believe this and go in his love and in his grace and in his power. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.